without further ado, I think we're going to go ahead and get started and allow people to filter on in if they uh, need to. But um, thank you all for joining us today uh, for this webinar with, um, with Dr. Hall um, about backyard birding and building a backyard wildlife sanctuary. Um, this is part of Georgia Grows Native for Birds Month 2023. And my name is Gabe Anderley. I'm the Habitat Program Manager at Georgia Audubon. And before we get started, I just want to give a few housekeeping notes. We are recording today's webinar and we will email you the link to the recording to all registered participants within the next seven to 10 days. You can also enable closed captioning for this webinar by clicking on the closed captioning button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will have time for a Q&A at the end of the webinar, so please add any questions you have to the Q&A box on your Zoom um, screen. And uh, this can be found at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and we'll get to as many of those as we can uh, today. And this is actually our sixth annual Georgia Grows Native for Birds Month, and your participation directly supports Georgia Audubon's conservation, education, and community engagement programs. So thank you. And I also want to thank uh, the Georgia Grows Native for Birds Month patrons whose names um, you saw scrolling in the slides just a minute or two ago. And our great appreciation to all of our patrons for their individual and very generous support of Georgia Audubon and Georgia Grows Native for Birds Month. So without further ado, I'm excited to uh, hand this off to my friend and fellow birder and our backyard birding and plant enthusiast. Um, Richard Hall, go ahead and uh, take it away. Okay, thanks uh, very much, Gabe. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone for uh, for coming. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and load up my uh, presentation. So all right, everyone see that? Hopefully, thumbs up. Um, <laughs> Looks good. Great. Yep. So, um, yeah, today I am going to talk to you a, a little bit about my kind of um, journey of highs and lows and ups and downs of um, learning how to uh, garden for the first uh, for the first time and some of the joy that that has brought me in terms of um, the, the birds that it's brought to, uh, to, to my yard. So uh, just to give you a little bit of background, as you can probably tell, while I have a southern accent, it's not a southern US accent. Um, I grew up just uh, east of London. Uh, sadly, uh, you know, I grew up just before the Barbie movie came out, because otherwise I think this outfit would have been uh, quite on, on trend for this year. Um, and I grew up, you know, being fascinated by the birds around me, whether that was sort of city pigeons or sparrows or, or something more uh, exotic. But I've loved birds my whole life. Um, so fast forward to many years later, and I had the opportunity to start a faculty job um, here at the University of Georgia, uh, and for the first time was in a, in a position to become a, a homeowner. And I was especially excited about the prospect of, of building a yard that might sort of attract a lot of birds to my, uh, to my neighborhood. So um, why, why should you create a bird-friendly backyard? Um, well, we're, we're kind of um, in this situation where uh, since the 1970s, um, we've lost, um, it's estimated, three billion of birds from North America. So what, one in four of our birds. And this is from sort of a, across the board. And uh, birds, like other species, one of the primary drivers um, of declines is loss and degradation of natural habitats. So it seems to me that, um, you know, if we're fortunate enough to have um, green spaces around where we live, um, that really um, we should try and make an effort to make those green spaces as safe and habitable and as accommodating for our birds as we can. And maybe these um, small actions that we take uh, in our individual backyards collectively um, could help sort of turn the tide against these bird declines. But building a backyard um, that's friendly for birds isn't just good for birds, it's actually good for our own well-being too. And increasingly, there's a lot of social science work uh, linking things like bird sounds or viewing birds close to your home uh, to your own sort of mental well-being. So a study out of Europe sort of um, estimated that Europeans um, having more bird species around their homes give them as much uh, satisfaction as earning a, a higher income. 
And uh, another recent study um, used smartphones to track uh, people's emotional state through time. And um, they recorded that seeing or hearing birds improved people's mental well being for up to eight hours. And I think backyard birding kind of really uh, hit the big time back in the, you know, the tough times of 2020, um, early COVID, when people really weren't going out, going out very much. Uh, people started paying attention much more to um, wildlife that was right around their homes, including uh, birds. And this was certainly true of my own family. This is my niece, Olivia, in England, who's drawn a really fine picture, I think, of a, a European robin. And then when I started um, my bird gardening project, uh, I decided that I was going to plant pretty much only native plants. And um, this was uh, for many reasons, but, but one of these is that uh, native plants support a lot of native insects. And um, a lot of our native birds, even if at other times of year, they might be eating fruits or berries or, or, or other things, uh, a lot of them during the breeding season need to um, feed a lot of insects to their chick, chicks. So this includes species like uh, Eastern bluebird um, and this cute line of uh, baby Eastern Phoebe fledglings uh, lined up sort of back to front there. It takes a lot of insects to feed them. And if you want insects in your yard, um, you really want to have native plants because while many pollinating insects can use non-native plants, a lot of them rely on native plant species that they co-evolved with as larval food plants. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll let you do a little quiz to yourself here. Um, does anyone know what this, uh, what this caterpillar is? Feel free to type it in the, uh, in, in the chat. It's a, it's a pretty well-known uh, caterpillar that, that, that feeds on a very specific host plant. That's monarch butterflies and, and milkweeds. Um, how about this one? This is a black swallowtailed, uh, black swallowtail caterpillar, and, the, and there's the adult. And then the other day I came across um, this one on my, uh, in, in my yard. Um, which was a, a species I'd never seen before on a plant called uh, Desmodium. Um, so, so this little uh, uh, chubby body here is going to turn into a into a long-tailed uh, skipper when it when it grows up. So um, these uh, these native insects can only feed on a limited range of host plants at their larval stage. So native plants support insects, and insects support birds. How many native plants do you need? Uh, it turns out quite a lot. So there was a study done in the sort of metropolitan DC area by Dr. Desiree, Desiree Narango five years ago now. And um, she tracked the, the nesting success of Carolina chickadees. Um, and she looked at attributes of people's yards, including the percentage uh, cover of native versus non-native plants. And she found that if you wanted to have chickadee populations um, that were kind of maintaining themselves through time, uh, so a stable chickadee population, you should really aim, be aiming for about 70% native plants in your yard, because that's just how many insects they need to, uh, to, to keep going. And so what we're going to talk about today is I'm going to try and convince you that kind of a well-designed backyard, both in terms of plantings and other natural features uh, in your yard, can provide a year-round avian interest. So that includes some of our familiar resident species like northern cardinals that might be eating insects like this moth in the summer um, and might switch more to eating seeds uh, in the winter. Uh, to supporting winter visitors through uh, providing uh, fruit-bearing shrubs like these, these gorgeous cedar waxwings. Uh, to uh, birds that are only going to be breeding with us um, during the summer here. So if you have a wooded backyard, you might be fortunate enough to see uh, wood thrushes or, or summer tanagers breeding in your neighborhood. But our yards can also be important way stations for some of our kind of uh, champion uh, long distance migrants. So birds like these wood warblers that might be spending the winter in Central or South America and then migrating up to the boreal forests of um, of Canada. And um, through the year, uh, with a well-designed yard, you might hope to attract a good variety of all of these species. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my, uh, my journey. So uh, this is what my yard lo looked like when I arrived. And I was pretty happy with that. I thought this is going to look good for birds. There's like lots of canopy cover. Seems like there's lots of stuff in the understory. 
Um, but I didn't know any of my plants. I didn't grow up here. So I invited a landscape architecture friend of mine uh, to walk around my yard. And I, I asked her to tell me um, which of the plants in, my, in, in this yard should I keep and which ones should I kind of rip out and replace with something else. And we walked around the yard and my friend Krista didn't say anything. Uh, she was just quiet. So we finished the tour of the yard and I said, well, what do you think? And she just said, take it all out because the yard was filled with um, a list of kind of well-known uh, non-native invasive species like English ivy, uh, bamboo, Japanese honeysuckle, Chinese privet, wisteria, uh, you name it, I had it in my yard and there actually wasn't really anything native below these, uh, below these water oaks. So I looked on the bright side and thought, well, now I have a, a blank canvas to plant up um, with lots of native plants. But I thought, where do, where do I start with this? And luckily, there's a lot of great online resources to help you when you're trying to decide on appropriate plantings for your, for your region and situation. And one of my favorite resources is um, hosted by the National Audubon. If you just Google plants for birds, it will take you to this website here. And um, there's a button on this um, just below the header that says find native plants for your area. And you can type in your zip code. So I typed in one here for kind of the Lawrenceville area. And it's going to tell you um, what native plants there are. So um, that are appropriate to your region. So it's saying here that um, uh, we found native plants for your zip code. The nearest Audubon offering native plants is Georgia Audubon, as you, as you hopefully know if you're on this call. And then it comes up with a list of plants and it tells you a little bit about whether they, they like shade or sun or moist soils, um, as well as how big they're going to get. But importantly, what wildlife they attract. So it gives you attributes like uh, whether they produce fruit or flowers and whether they support, say, butterflies, um, as well as what kinds of birds they support. So I feel like that's a really great resource for getting going. Um, another thing you can do is get your yard um, certified. So um, Georgia Audubon is one of the uh, organizations that can off offer to kind of certify your yard uh, for you. And so for a, for a small contribution to Georgia Audubon, you can get um, someone who's an expert to kind of tour your yard and um, help you decide on kind of attributes or potential plantings that would maximize its value for wildlife. Um, and as well as this information, one of the things you get out of it um, is this nice uh, Audubon sign and that sign doesn't just give you um, bragging rights. Um, I put mine up in the in the front yard and it's not really uh, bragging rights. It's more of a kind of indication to my neighbors as to what's going on, because my front yard is full of native plants. And it looks a little bit different than a lot of other yards in my street that are that are mostly just um, lawn. And so having a sign like that and out in your neighborhood can kind of indicate uh, to, to your neighbors that this is actually like um, intentional, this isn't neglect or wilderness, that you're trying to cultivate natural habitats that support our native wildlife. And we are coming up to one of my favorite times of the year, which is the native plant sales. And um, so there's a, a number of great nurseries um, in the uh, Atlanta and Athens area. One of my favorites is Beach Hollow Farm and Georgia Audubon members actually will get a discount in the first couple of weekends of um, October um, if they buy native plants um, at their Atlanta location in Scottsdale. And if you all want to come over to Athens, um, you can have not only great migratory birding in the botanical gardens at this time of year, um, but there are six days of all native plant sales down in the garden. And I can tell you they have a lot of really good stuff. But I have to warn you, native plant sales can be a bit addicting. And so um, I very quickly um, found my found myself kind of filling my car uh, with native plants. But, you know, I had a, an empty yard and I took this carload of plants back and it looked like not a drop in the ocean. So um, off I went again. And uh, a few trips later, um, I had a reasonable number of plants. But then I realized that I'd made a bit of a rookie mistake. Um, it was October and it had been a little bit dry and I went to plant these plants. And what did I find but um, hard, solid Georgia red clay. Um, and uh, I wish in hindsight, I had listened to the wisdom of the uh, Eastern Phoebe, uh, who told me that I should have started small, uh, learned a little bit about my soil type before buying all these plants. Um, and I certainly advocate for the value of building raised beds um, that will save you a lot of uh, backache and make your life easier for getting these plants in the ground. 
so now I'm going to sort of talk about my my process for for um, how I kind of design my yard. And really, I because I was primarily doing this for the bird's benefit, I needed to sort of think like a bird. So what do birds need? Uh, they need sources of, of food. Um, and there's lots of different birds with different diets. So you want a mixture of kind of uh, fruits, flowers, uh, insects, uh, seeds, and, and so on. But birds also need um, water. Many of them need to sort of drink water directly uh, if they don't get it from their food. But almost all birds um, like to visit water for feather maintenance. You know, their feathers are critical to their uh, survival. So they, they like a good place to bathe. Um, and then additionally, they need structure. So they need shelter from uh, harsh elements like this uh, Baltimore Oriole that probably regretted wintering in my yard when we had those um, sub-zero days um, back in Christmas Eve when it was very chilly here and snowing. Um, and also these structures can be a refuge from predators and provide structure for birds to nest in like this little female northern cardinal on her nest. So when you're thinking about kind of the structure of your yard, um, I think you should be aiming for to make your yard as 3D as possible. So to have as much, as many layers and, and complexity as you can. So if you have the space for this, the ideal is to have a mix of kind of taller trees, mid-sized shrubs, as well as kind of flower beds and, and grasses, as well as short ground cover, because that diversity of, um, of heights and structures of vegetations is going to support a really big diversity of, of, of birds and, and, and insects. So a well-designed uh, native yard might look something like this, where in addition to sort of manicured areas like paths and lawns, uh, you might have a water feature, uh, flower beds, and then kind of uh, beds that have shrubs kind of leading up to taller trees. So lots of nice complexity and, and places for wildlife to hang out. So let's talk about some of the things that, that, that birds need. And so uh, there's a number of uh, sea, seed eating birds um, and some larger birds like jays and a lot of birds in the blackbird family, the icterids, uh, like to eat tree seeds and they, they have hefty bills. So they can often manage to get into um, pretty uh, hard seeds to crack like uh, acorns. These are a pair of common grackles eating acorns in my yard. Uh, and if you're very lucky, you might have a species we're, we're fortunate to have here in the winter, uh, which is the rusty blackbird. It's a bird that's declined by um, an estimated 99% um, over just a, a few decades, but we can still have uh, flocks of these that move through our neighborhoods. And um, while these birds are capable of kind of uh, crushing like an open pecan seed, I often notice that these birds are feeding at the roadside, that they'll often let the cars kind of run them over first to create a kind of nutty granola for them um, on, the, on the road surface. And then flower seeds are, are kind of crucially important for um, a lot of seed eating uh, species. So particularly sparrows and finches, and the American goldfinch is a finch that's uh, here with us in the Georgia Piedmont year round. And um, they're kind of an interesting species because they nest a little bit later in the summer than a lot of our insect eating birds because they're trying to time um, their, their nesting so that when they're, when they're young fledge, there's a whole lot of um, flower seeds for them to eat. And that typically occurs later in the summer as opposed to the insect eating birds that are getting going early in the spring. So uh, plants like this uh, purple coneflower, echinacea is really popular. Black-eyed Susans are really popular. Um, but these seeds can provide a source through many seasons. So I strongly encourage you um, not to deadhead um, your plants or, or at, least, at least not all of those. Um, not, not deadheading your, your seeds provides um, little protein packets for birds that are arriving in the fall and staying through the winter. So some of you may remember a couple of years back, we had a really large um, eruption in invasion year of pine siskins to our area. And I remember the day that they arrived and about 50 of these birds um, descended on my gray headed coneflower seed heads and rapidly sort of devoured everything. And sometimes that'll even bring you surprises because uh, my yard here, I'm, I'm sort of in the middle of Athens. It's pretty urban and there's a good amount of tree cover. Um, and so I was very surprised to see this open country bird, um, a savannah sparrow hopping around on my patio. But again, it had found this, um, this source of seeds that had fallen from my seed head and, and spent kind of a morning happily chowing down on these coneflower seeds. So you never know what you'll see when you plant native. 
Of course, a favorite bird of, of birders and bird gardeners is the ruby-throated hummingbird, um, which is with us from you know, kind of late March, um, and there are still several around now. Um, they'll be kind of leaving into October and, and heading south from here. Um, but, you know, if you want to attract and maintain hummingbirds in your yard, you want to think about flowering plants that, that they can use um, for the duration of their time here. And a good clue to whether a, a plant is a, a nice hummingbird plant is um, they're often colored red, um, but also they're often kind of tubular because these plants have kind of co-evolved with hummingbirds as, as pollinators. Um, so um, early in the spring, red columbine on the left is a good hummingbird food plant. And then one of my favorites that starts blooming here in Athens in April is, um, is Indian pink. And uh, you can see that male ruby-throated hummingbird there. That little sparkle on his forehead um, is not actually feathers or feather iridescence. It's a dusting of pollen that he's got from the anthers of those plants. So the, uh, you know, this is a mutualism where the uh, hummingbird is getting a, a, a tasty nectar treat and the plant is depositing pollen that's then uh, scattered onto uh, other flowers. In the middle of the summer, one of my favorite hummingbird plants is um, scarlet bee balm. Uh, the hummingbirds are all over this and fighting all over it. And again, you can see this youngster on the right has this lovely kind of yellow pollen crown. So uh, that bird's been feeding well and hopefully producing um, a lot of seeds and uh, more bee balm for my yard. In the late summer and early fall, um, cardinal flower is one that's very popular with, with hummingbirds in my yard. And then one of my favorite uh, plants, if you have a, a place where you can train a vine, I really like uh, coral honeysuckle. It's a, it's a really great plant. And um, if it doesn't get too cold, this plant can have a few flowers on it in almost any month of the year, although the flowers are most profuse in the, in, in the spring. But native yards can also support some of our kind of newer visitors to Georgia. So increasingly in the southeastern US, we're seeing this interesting phenomenon where um, hummingbirds from the west, western US, rather than heading due south into Mexico and Central America, many of them are coming to the, the southeastern US uh, and the warmer winters that support insect activity. Um, as well as kind of longer blooming periods of flowers. And of course, people leaving out their hummingbird feeders in the winter means that there's food for these species year round. And after hoping for a, a winter hummingbird for many, many years, I was fortunate a couple of winters ago uh, to have two show up at once. Um, this young male black chinned hummingbird on the left, we knew he wasn't a ruby throat because of that lovely purple iridescence in the throat. And then an adult female rufous hummingbird, and she's come back for two consecutive winters. And even though these birds, um, you know, are readily using things like uh, human hummingbird feeders, they need insects. And um, having um, some, you know, native plants uh, leaving the dead stems in place, I found that that provided nice perches for these hummingbirds. It also helped them shelter from inclement weather. And I noticed on warm days that around these dead stems, um, often there'd be a few flying insects emerging. And I saw uh, my Rufus happily fly catching in that spot. So thinking about birds that eat fruit, um, fruit is a really popular uh, food for migratory birds. It really helps them fatten up and complete their migratory journeys. And uh, one of my favorite uh, fruiting uh, trees in the, summer, in, the, in the spring is the red mulberry tree. So um, the, the one in my yard starts kind of fruiting around early May, and it's really a magnet for some interesting species like um, uh, tanagers, um, cedar wax wings, which are staying kind of really late into late May to capitalize on these uh, mulberries, uh, rose-breasted grosbeaks, that's the female there in the middle, and sometimes even some surprising species, some skulking species like yellow-breasted chat that I think of more as a bird of open country, uh, even they find the red mulberries when they're, when they're in season. Um, but you might also see some grizzly scenes like this uh, uh, red eyed vireo that looks like it's been on a killing spree, but in fact it just went to town on the mulberries. And so you can see it's got this kind of red stained uh, chest and, and, and face from chowing down on those mulberries. So the mulberries are really popular with migrants. Uh, coming into the fall, one of my favorite um, 
fall berries for uh, for migrants is by Devil's Walking Stick. Um, this is a cool plant that has a very thorny stem, and it produces a show of white flowers late in the summer at a time when not other, not many other native plants are flowering. So it's always loaded with bees and butterflies. And when it's finished flowering, it produces these attractive pink stems with kind of bluish purple berries on the end. And you can see there, uh, there's a a northern mockingbird with a brown thrasher watching enviously in the background. But I've also had tanagers and vireos visit that. Um, and American beautyberry and even plain old pokeweed um, are, are kind of really popular uh, for berry eating birds. And of course, we want to provide food for our insect eating birds in, in, in all seasons. Um, and it turns out there's a bunch of birds that like to eat um, uh, caterpillars and other insect larvae. And um, not all plants are uh, created equal in that regard. It turns out that there are these native plant superfoods, so certain trees, shrubs, and flowers that host more diversity um, of insect larvae, insect herbivores than you might imagine. And so, um, you know, if you have room for big trees in your yard, um, oaks host many hundreds of caterpillar species. Uh, cherries, willows, dogwoods are also really good. And um, they, they can be providing um, food throughout the uh, throughout the summer and the fall for our migratory species, as well as familiar residents like Carolina wren. Thinking about uh, plants you might put in your um, in your flowering beds, um, plants like goldenrods, uh, other asters, and sunflowers um, are really loaded with caterpillars, um, and they're all starting to come into their own in this season. So my uh, wrinkle leaf goldenrod is looking really really great right now. And birds will re readily uh, forage in these. And you might see a slightly different collection of birds than those that are feeding way up in the canopy. Birds like prairie warblers, or if you're very lucky, something like a Nashville warbler might stop by uh, to grab an insect snack. And we shouldn't forget about those um, uh, those bird species that are primarily foraging for uh, insects on the on the ground. And a, a lot of these birds, even though they're not especially closely related, look pretty similar. They're kind of like brown and spotty, which I think helps them blend in with dappled sunlight on the forest floor. Um, and if you want to support these, uh, these birds, you want to make sure that there's insect habitat uh, in your yard. And one of my favorite things about native gardening is it does give you um, some excuses to be uh, a little less fastidious about your yard maintenance. Uh, so one of the main messages in native gardening is to kind of leave the leaves or uh, in places where you have to sweep leaves away, leave them in a pile in your yard rather than having them uh, taken away by your city's leaf and limb. Because these leaves are kind of loaded with overwintering um, insects that can provide food through the winter uh, for birds like the hermit thrush that will be foraging for those insects in the winter. And similarly, if you do have a lawn, um, you know, considering consider letting some um, flowers grow up in that. So something like clover often supports uh, early emerging bees before the native plants really get going. Um, and, uh, and if you can really try to avoid uh, pesticides um, that, um, you know, are, are detrimental to the insects that are living in the ground and therefore the birds that want to feed on them. So that's some example of some plants you could use in your yard, but there are other ways that you can use uh, or enhance natural features in your yard. So I think I mentioned that my, my yard canopy is all kind of water oaks, and any of you that have water oaks might know that whenever the wind blows, um, these, these uh, trees shed limbs left, right, and center. And the plus side of this is that you can incorporate them into your land uh, landscaping. So some of them are used to edge flower beds, um, but other smaller branches, I just pile up in a in a into a brush pile. So a, a structure of kind of loosely piled branches, you know, maybe six feet tall. Um, and these um, these brush pile features are great, especially in the in the winter uh, for birds to um, roost in, to shelter in. They can be a good spot for a bird to duck into um, if a predator like a hawk comes through your yard. And my brush pile is kind of readily used by these white throated sparrows in the in the winter. Other important habitats that are useful for, for, for birds and bugs would be dead wood. So, um, you know, if you have a tree that, that, that dies in your yard, provided it's not in a place where it's gonna damage your property or somebody else's, you might consider leaving that tree in place. 
or if if you're gonna have to remove some of the limbs, maybe at least leaving um, the trunk or a snag or two. Um, these um, these are very sort of popular perching spots. Um, so I had a red maple die in my in my front yard a couple of years ago, and that little dot that you can see uh, up at the tip top in the left there turned out to be a Mississippi kite that used it for several days as a perch to hawk for flying uh, insects. So that's a pretty cool yard bird. And then these trees often serve as a scaffold for um, for vines. And uh, my dead red maple hosted this um, lovely Virginia creeper vine. And um, this was really gobbled up by migratory birds like vireos and these th Swainson's thrushes. And I think what you can see here is two Swainson's thrushes fighting over the very last Virginia creeper berry on that vine. Deadwood is also important because the wood's soft that allows cavity uh, nesting birds to excavate nests. So it's really important for special birds like um, the brown-headed nuthatch, which is only found here in the southeastern US. Um, so leaving, leaving some dead trunks or dead snags around is good for them. If you're not in a situation to have kind of de dead wood around your yard, you can provide a substitute in the form of birdhouses. But I'd thoroughly recommend if you mount these on a pole that you put up some kind of device like this squirrel baffle that's going to try that's going to um, prevent predators like rat snakes or, or, or rodents from accessing the nest. And then. Um, you know, one of my favorite uh, features, I think what's really transformed my backyard birding experience um, is installing a water feature. And I think, um, you know, if, if you have any capacity to provide water in your yard, whether this is just in a, in a you know, a flower pot on your, on your deck to something more elaborate, like, well, like what I've got here with moving water, um, it's going to attract birds because no matter what their diet, um, all birds need to drink or, or bathe. And um, birds absolutely love um, shallow water um, with, with perches that they can um, uh, approach the water and maybe pebbles um, in the water that they, can, um, that they can stand on. And if you have any um, possibility to keep water moving in your water feature, that's really helpful. I feel like the light, the, uh, the, the reflection of the, the light of the water, as well as the sound it makes, I think helps birds find it. But from a more pragmatic point of view in the south, um, you know, if you have still standing water, you're going to need to kind of change that out pretty regularly to stop mosquitoes breeding. Uh, and this flowing water keeps the water kind of aerated and pretty clean, and it stops mosquitoes breeding in it. So, th so this is a, a, a photo of my um, pond setup where I've got this kind of short fountain that leads into a stream that's roughly eight feet long, and that empties into a pond. And there's a pump at the back of that pond that pushes the water around. And then around there, I've got some landscaping rocks that I've let kind of mosses grow up on. And I've put some low ground covers. So plants like partridge berry and green and gold to provide some low ground cover um, so I can kind of see into the pond. But then around the pond, again, I've used some of this dead wood to create branches, perches for birds as they're coming down from the tree tops. Tree tops. And I've tried to think about having um, vegetation that's structured. So kind of shy birds coming down from the treetops can kind of move down into shrubs, um, into kind of taller flowering plants and feel comfortable and safe from predators approaching this water feature. And yeah, one of the big pluses of this is it brings down um, some really pretty birds that can otherwise be quite hard to see down from the treetops. Um, so in the spring, I'm, I'm quite lucky to get uh, regularly things like scarlet tanagers. Um, this cute male on the left um, is still kind of molting out of his non-breeding plumage. So kind of uh, some nice kind of neon yellow as well as that bright red. I sometimes get a, a thrush party in the late fall. All the thrushes um, that are attracted to the red mulberry will come in in the evening to bathe. And you sometimes see multiple species together like this virion, this Swainson's thrush. And then of course, it's always a treat to see rose-breasted grosbeaks. Um, and you know, watching these birds, you see them in a different light. And I'd often see these birds lifting their wings and I realized they're not just rose-breasted but they're sort of rose armpitted as well. And sometimes you get some really surprising encounters. Um, so a couple of times now, um, I've looked out at my pond and seen a kind of motionless morning dove sized bird. But, you know, you think this looks a bit weird. It's not quite right for a morning dove. And, you know, you lift your binoculars and, and there you have a yellow billed cuckoo, which is a pretty big bird, but it's a pretty secretive bird that can be very hard to get a look at. But on hot days, even they need to drink and bathe and they will uh, come into a water feature.
And bigger birds still will use this water feature. So sometimes Cooper's hawks and red shoulders hawks will come in to bathe. Uh, but I think the biggest bird I ever had was a was a great blue uh, a great blue heron with a suspicious lump in its neck, which I hope was a you know a frog rather than a a cardinal or <laughs> one of my uh, one of my warblers. So you know, as as birders. Um, you know, we're very fond of, of warblers. Um, they're brightly colored, they're, they're diverse. And, you know, when we look online or we look at the front covers of our field guides, we'll see images like this cerulean warbler, which is just, you know, shockingly be blue and beautiful. And this is what we hope to see. And then we go out birding, and maybe this is actually our experience of a cerulean warbler. We're seeing it from the underside, pretty dimly lit. We're hoping we see enough of the tail feather pattern or some side streaks to help us identify it. And I think, uh, you know, this phenomenon is so well known that uh, it's become known as warbler neck. Uh, and don't worry, uh, it's a common phenomenon and there's a support group. We're, we're all here for you. But one of the joys of putting in a water feature is that warblers absolutely love to come into ponds to um, to bathe. Um, and, um, you know, this this is going to save you from war, uh, warbler neck. Suddenly you're going to be seeing these these species at eye level or, or below. So um, every spring I'm, I'm really fortunate to get birds like Cape Mate warbler, American Red Start, or sometimes, you know, these beautiful hooded warblers coming into the pond. Um, as well as some of the kind of longer distance migrants like Magnolia Canada and, and, and bay-breasted warblers. So some real beauties uh, coming through in the spring. In the fall, some of these warblers um, aren't looking quite as, um, as bright, but there's many more of them because there's lots of young birds around. And additionally, typically the fall is pretty dry here in Georgia. And so that water is especially attractive to them. So you might see species like a Blackburnian warbler, sometimes uh, multiple at once or black throated green warblers. And this bird on the right is, I, I guess, kind of breaking news that I was thrilled that, um, you know, for the first time I saw a, a lovely blue winged warbler come all the way down to the pond and um, and take a bath. And it's just a lovely bird to appreciate at that low uh, level. Um, and even birds that aren't necessarily up in the canopy, but are, are pretty shy, will come out in the open um, and you can see some real surprises. Um, and I, I think I wanted to emphasize that even though my water feature is a, is a little bit um, elaborate, uh, it doesn't have to be that way. So this Kentucky warbler, you might see that it's actually bathing in a dish here because this was a time when we'd had a power outage and my pond wasn't working for a couple of days. And I just put a water dish out there and uh, my one and only record of Kentucky warbler came in. But I've also had, um, you know, nice skulking species like worm eating warbler a few times, uh, as well as a couple that kind of raised my eyebrows like this Connecticut warbler, which, you know, might not be the flashiest of the warblers, but, um, uh, as, as Georgia birders will know, it's very, very hard to uh, grab a glimpse of. So, you know, I almost kind of fell off my chair when I looked out my window and saw this outside. So um, just for fun, I'm going to play you um, a, sh a short video, which I hope is going to uh, convince you if you had any doubts that you should think about getting some kind of water feature in your yard. And I shot this video over a couple of days last October when it had been pretty dry, um, but there was still a good diversity of migrants around. Um, so um, I'll try and give you some running commentary as I play this video of, um, of, of some of the species and see how many you recognize. So we're starting off here with a bay-breasted warbler as we pan over. There's a black and white warbler and a Tennessee warbler. Suddenly we are um, into uh, Cape May warblers and uh, there's a, a Wilson's warbler. Uh, the bay-breasted is back with another Cape May that it chases off. Here's a Cape May, black throated green warbler. Taking a nice long bath there. And there's black and white warbler um, and uh, another young Cape May. There's a chestnut sided um, Cape May warbler again. May Day, apparently, lots of those around. Uh, and a Tennessee warbler came in into the front to join them there. But, um, another Tennessee warbler who's in, uh, interrupting the bath of a, a, a young Blackburnian warbler there. And here's a yellow throated warbler who's about to be upstaged by one of our favorites, uh, a male Eastern bluebird. And here we've got a, a red start, a female or immature, um, often flashes and fans its tail to show you those bright uh, tail spots. This bird, though it has a yellow rump, is not a yellow rumped warbler. It's a magnolia warbler. You can tell by those wing bars. And um, here's one of my favorite warblers, a lovely uh, northern perula that just got displaced by a Tennessee warbler, which got displaced by a yellow-throated vireo. 
But it's not just the migrants. Uh, sometimes we get a whole bunch of cardinals at once. Um, as the fall moves on, we start to get multiple ruby crown kinglets. And here we've got a nice resident migrant combo of a Swainson stosh with a young eastern toey. Just about keeping up, there's a nice uh, grey catbird uh, with us through the summer. And then this is one of my uh, wintering Baltimore Orioles that came in to join uh, a bunch of Tennessee warblers to uh, to babe. So I'll take a I'll, I'll take a breath there, um, and um, we'll we'll start to wrap this up now. Um, so um, I just wanted to kind of show you how over the past kind of 13 years my my yard has evolved and continues to evolve as I learn more about plants and kind of um, how I want the aesthetic of the landscape to look. So you'll record this is what the yard looked like uh, when I started pretty pretty bare in the middle with lots of invasives at the edge. Uh, so I started to kind of build out from the edges, create kind of islands of habitats where I planted um, shrubs that I thought were going to get taller. If you look over to the to the left of the yard there and to the left of the path, um, that's my, my pond set up there. So you can see it's under those oak trees with the nice layers of vegetation that help the birds feel comfortable coming down to it. Um, so I thought this was looking pretty okay, but then I thought, ah, you know, lawns are overrated and I didn't want to do any mowing. Um, so I started shrinking it even further and expanding those beds. And so this was taken uh, earlier that, this summer. And you can see a lot of those shrubs and smaller trees have really started to come into their own and, and, and fill out. And uh, just to give you a perspective at a different time of year, my backyard's pretty uh, sort of dappled shade. And there's a lot of nice spring ephemeral wildflowers before those um, oaks are leafing out that provide a lot of color and interest. Um, so here there's some um, spring phlox, um, some heartleaf foam flower, the white ones. You might see a couple of tufts of columbine for the hummingbirds there and some flame azaleas in the background. This is what my front yard looked like when I when I moved into the house. So it was pretty kind of um, threadbare lawn um, and some non-native plants, including some like Nandina or Heavenly Bamboo that's actually harmful to birds. Um, I'd recommend you, uh, you think about alternatives for replacing that if you have it in your yard. So I thought, oh, you know, this, this, this lawn is threadbare and it's pretty kind of overrated. Um, but still, I grew up with lawns and every other neighborhood, every other house in the neighborhood had a lawn. So I thought, I'm going to start small this time. I've learned my lessons from the backyard. So I'm going to slowly start building out beds uh, piece by piece. And so this is how I've kind of constructed raised beds. I put some cardboard down to kind of smother the vegetation beneath. I've added some topsoil. Uh, then when, when it comes to kind of native plant season, I'm able to fill them. But, you know, once you start on this journey of uh, replacing lawns, it kind of emboldens you and fast forward to uh, a few years later. And um, I've got this kind of mini prairie in my front yard, which is sort of bursting at the seams. But I absolutely love this this bed in the summer. It's packed full of goldfinches, hummingbirds, butterflies and bees. And it, it kind of really uh, it really cheers me up. Um, here are some photos from later this summer. Um, because I guess in my native plant journey, I'm 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 slowly kind of learning um, about how big certain plants will get, and it kind of shocked me exactly how large some of these plants I I, I put in could get. Several of these plants were getting to eight to ten feet tall, and I started thinking, you know, this is this is great, but you know, I don't want to sort of create some situation with with my neighbors where they feel like these plants are kind of looming over them. Um, and looking too unmanaged. Um, so I've started this process of thinking about where I'm putting plants. So these plants by my mailbox, uh, things like these um, these cone flowers, um, and there's some columbine there as well. I'm trying to choose plants right next to the roadside that aren't really gonna get much more than sort of knee height. And then some of the plants that are gonna get a little bit taller and rangier, I'm sort of layering them by the heights they're going to get to. And in some cases kind of pruning them down so that we see this kind of natural transition transition of the layers. Um, and again, hopefully it looks both kind of natural, but also um, a little bit sort of harmonious and, and not too overgrown. And uh, yeah, sort of similarly, I've done the same with like goldenrods and, and muley grasses and mountain mints at the front, at the very front of the property before you transition back to shrubs like beauty berries and some of the taller flowers like um, cut leaf coneflower. 
So um, yeah, just to wrap up, I'd encourage you that, I, I hope this has encouraged you that backyards can be really like attractive to birds. Um, and not only can you benefit birds uh, in your own backyard, but you can contribute to broader efforts of bird con conservation by contributing your bird sightings to a, a variety of community science projects, including um, eBird that I use for birds or iNaturalist that I tend to use for insects um, where I just sort of cheat and take a photo and let iNaturalist do the hard work for me. Um, and it, and um, there are also kind of uh, occasional activities. So if you want to count birds only in the winter, Project Feeder Watch is a great project to get involved in. Um, or if you just want to do that on Valentine's Day, um, the, the great backyard bird count goes on for four days in the, in the middle of February. And it's a great way to introduce kids and newbie birders to birding. So some of the things I've I've kind of learned about uh, birds in this process of of having this uh, native backyard um, is I've I've learned out some really learned some really fun things about migration. So uh, a few years back, um, I was very happy to see this gray cheek thrush come into the pond. So that's um, you know a, a pretty scarce bird. I always feel happy if I see one or two of these in the year. But if you look really, really closely at the legs of these birds, and I'm circling this with my cursor now, um, if you look at the one of the legs of this bird, you're going to see it's actually got a metal band on it. So this bird had been um, had been banded. So I tried very hard um, to um, get close to this bird, and I took a bunch of photos um, where uh, I know these look like hieroglyphics, but I was able to get photos of this band from uh, multiple angles, and I was able to read um, at least five of the numbers on it. And based on the leg it was banded on, as well as the unique numbers I could read, we were actually able to identify that this bird had been um, banded in Connecticut um, several weeks prior and 900 miles to the northeast of Athens. And it just kind of blew my mind that I, I knew a little bit of the history of this bird, uh, bird's journey. And, and sort of really brought home that we're we're hosting we're you know we're fortunate to host these champion long distance migrants and uh, some of you may remember last year um when all hell broke loose in my yard because uh, uh a, a kind of quiet august day was um brought to life when this uh, cute little bird showed up in my yard it turned out to be a bell's vireo which was actually just the fifth record for the state of georgia um, and even more amazingly, because this bird was so rare, we knew it was the same individual we were seeing on um, consecutive days. And so this bird stayed for a total of nine days, um, fattening up on uh, bugs and berries in the yard. And it was a really unique opportunity to watch what it was feeding on. Um, so I was able to see that it was eating, you know, caterpillars from my native plant stems, uh, eating like beautyberry um, and um, devil's walking stick berries, um, as well as insects. Although the bird kind of in the second from the left, uh, it was it was going after a ladybird in this shot, a ladybird beetle in this shot. And, uh, you know, ladybugs are colored red and black for a reason. They don't tend to taste very good. So I wonder if uh, he had some heartburn after after that meal. Um, but, you know, one, one of the joys of having that bird in my yard was that um, I got to sort of uh, visit with lots of birding friends from across the state of Georgia that came to see it. Um, and it was also really heartening to see, um, you know, birders connecting with um, not just the bird, but looking at how it was using the habitat and maybe taking away from that some ideas for um, uh, plantings that they might try and incorporate in their own yard to support, um, you know, common birds as well as um, as well as rare birds. So uh, installing a native garden is a, is a great way to sort of educate and inspire, you know, fellow birders or, or, or your neighbors. And a lot of people walking their dogs on the street are always interested when they see me out gardening to know what's blooming and mention that they appreciate seeing, you know, the butterflies and bees in the, in, in the yard. Um, and then, you know, again, I'm, I, I'm increasingly struck by, you know, since many of the birds that we all love are, are in decline, um, and a lot of this is due, due to sort of um, human habitat changes, it almost feels like an imperative that if we have green space around our houses, that we should be trying to make this hospitable for our birds. And, you know, during that period of COVID lockdown where we weren't traveling very much, I still felt very connected to the wider world because birds like this black pole warbler that do these incredible um, transoceanic migrations, um, you know, from northern South America all the way up to the boreal forests of Alaska. It just sort of blows my mind. And I feel so privileged when they choose to stop in my yard for a, a, a few a few days. It's a really great fe feeling. And so just to kind of close out this talk, um, I'll, I'll take a quote from uh, Doug Tallamy, um, who's a scientist and popular uh, author 
who uh, I think has really kick-started this movement towards making our, our backyards very friendly for wildlife. And he leaves us with this thought that if Americans converted just half of their existing lawns into wildlife habitat, that would result in more than 20 million acres of wildlife habitat, which is the equivalent of 10 Yellowstone uh, national parks. So again, these small collective actions we take in our own backyards, if we can uh, convince at least one other person to do that, and they can convince one other person to make their yard more native, um, we're going to potentially have this um, you know, uh, accelerating effect of preserving, very, uh, preserving bird habitat. Um, so with that, I'll stop talking, and I would be very happy to uh, take your questions. All right, thank you so much, Richard. That was awesome. And um, certainly your yard is pretty special. Uh, any small backyard that would rank in the top 10 in either Clark or Fulton County as a hot spot for birding with over 150 species is, is pretty neat. And to see what you've done just with native plants and the different resources is, is really inspiring. So um, yes, we're now gonna get into a questions and if anybody has questions, um, feel free to add them to the Q&A box instead of the chat. The chat's just a little bit uh, more difficult for, for me to follow, but I'll go ahead and start uh, relaying some of these to you, Richard. The first one is how big is your yard? Um, yeah, so it's not, it's not that, it's all relative, right? Coming from England, my yard seems huge, but sort of, I think by Georgia standards, it's not that big. So uh, my, my whole um, sort of property, including the footprint of the house um, is, is a quarter of an acre. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not especially large. Um, it's, um, it's pretty sort of long and narrow at the back. Um, yeah, so not, not huge, but, but even in the small space, you can, you can make a lot of difference and attract a lot of birds. Now, when do you typically cut plants back, your herbaceous plant material? Yeah, I am. Um, I'm still. Um, I'm still sort of learning that. Um, I think uh, to some extent um, it might depend on the on the plant species. So a lot a lot of my plants can get a bit sort of tall and rangy. So sometimes my scarlet bee barns get sort of pretty uh, pretty tall, and they're starting flowering in June. So I think if you're going to cut them back, you probably want to do that at least a month um, before they're going to be uh, producing flowers. So things like bee balm, I'm maybe sort of thinking about cutting back um, even even in May. Um, but I'd say it's sort of right now for things like swamp sunflowers that are going to be sort of going, uh, you know, full full bloom in, in October. I'm, I'm cutting those back then. So um, I think there's some rule of thumb about kind of like uh, J July 4th, but I, I've been able to cut pl plants back later than that and, and have them bloom um, bloom again. Um, so, yeah, figure out what time things, you know, I would say let plants grow to their full potential in year one, figure out when they're blooming, and then sort of work backwards from that and give them like a, at least a month between, uh, or six weeks even, uh, between cutting and when you expect them to flower. Yeah, additionally, with that, um, how about cutting back uh, dead vegetation in the winter? Is there, are you typically doing that um, at a particular point um, to allow, you know, habitat for insects and things like that? Um, or does it kind of depend on where it is in the yard or what does that look like for you? Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I guess for, for, I'm only really cutting things back when they start to sort of ob obstruct, uh, you know, walkways or, uh, get too big for their boots. So, um, I usually do some, uh, pruning like just before the first frost because uh, you know a lot of insects are active and still until we start getting frosts and I, I try to sort of avoid doing too much cutting when I think that insects might be actually kind of um, you know in in the stems or along uh, uh, along the stems and and I'll do another kind of trim in the late winter just before kind of green up uh, starts yeah awesome uh, the next question I have is do native gardens require more maintenance or less? Um, I, I'm going to say less in the long term. I think, you know, native gardens uh, need some TLC. The year that you plant your plants, you know, you need to kind of 
uh, especially if you do that in the spring and there's a, a hot summer to come, uh, you need to keep them watered uh, while they get established. But the great thing about native plants is uh, plants that, you know, thrive in this area occasionally have to uh, cope with these periods of extended uh, drought. And so once they're established, they put down deep roots. So I actually find you don't have to do very much watering at all. The year after plants are established, they're usually good to fend for themselves and require sort of minimum uh, watering. And um, I, th I think the question of maintenance, it, it, it to some extent depends on what um, what species you plant. So some some of the species I've planted get pretty prolific. Things like giant ironweed gets tall, but also kind of sprouts um, all, all over the yard. And so that's sometimes a plant that I have to prune. And if I don't get around to pruning it before a storm comes, I'm, I'm, I'm tying it sort of back up. But, you know, plants like um, coneflowers and mountain mints, things that are kind of knee height, um, they don't really seem to require very much maintenance at all. I certainly think it's less maintenance than something like, uh, you know, maintaining a, a pristine lawn. Now, how did you go about building the stream that you have, the water feature in your yard? Yeah, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll fess up. I, I completely cheated there. Um, having been traumatized by digging into hard red clay, I actually got a, a landscaper to install mine uh, for me. But the good news is that um, it is relatively straightforward to do this yourself. And there are other Georgia Audubon members like Bob Zaremba um, who've bought the raw materials. Essentially, uh, you, you can you can buy these these uh, pumps for ponds um, and, and, and a little kind of plastic reservoir to keep that in. Then the stream itself, you want to line that with a thick tarp to stop roots uh, penetrating through. And then, you know, I've just got essentially uh, pebbles in, in the bottom of that, some ornamental rocks for, for lining it. Um, and I think if you do it yourself, um, you might be looking at a budget of like four or $500 for something equivalent to that. Um, if you're interested, you can also Google pondless waterfall kits. You can buy kits that come with all of the ingredients um, to provide um, a moving stream without sort of having the, the, the pond at the end of it. But honestly, uh, even if you have a regular bird bath, if you can get anything like a dripper or even a solar powered bubbler that just kind of moves the water a little bit, um, that's still going to work pretty well. So whatever works for your, your space and budget, like, uh, you know, provide water any way you can. And while we're talking about the pond, how do you get moss to grow on your water feature rocks? And are there any species of moss that are more beneficial to have? Um, I do not know the answer to the second. Uh, I suppose I don't know the answer to the first of that either. Um, the moss just colonized. I didn't do anything um, special uh, to cause that moss to colonize. Um, it just appeared. I mean, it, you know, it's regularly getting moisture from the from the stream, especially as birds like splash about in it. And also the situation of my pond where it's sort of fairly uh, shaded, um, it doesn't tend to sort of dry out um, either. Um, I loosely recall some, I, I can't remember what, maybe you'll have to get back to me on this because I do remember a colleague of mine actually did transplant moss and they created some kind of substrate, some sticky, sticky substrate to sort of get it going on the rocks. But in my case, it just colonized um, naturally. Um, and the cool. robins love it. They, they pick the moss off to kind of line their, their nests, which is always fun to see. That is neat. Uh, do you ever open up your yard for visitation uh, by strangers? <laughs> um, we can. Um, so, yes, I mean, for example, the, you know, with the when I hosted this, uh, this rare bird, you know, it seemed rude not to share it. Um, so, uh, yeah, maybe if you're interested in um, visiting, uh, perhaps you could talk to Gabe and we could sort of set something out. Um, I mean, you know, G Gabe's been to my yard like it's. Um, you know, for 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 a birding group, um, you know, uh, it it's a bit crowded to have like lots and lots of people at the time. But you know, I can have you know four or five people like very very comfortably there and sitting in a way that they wouldn't be like disturbing the birds in the in the pond. So um, yeah, how about you uh, reach out to Gabe or someone at, at Georgia Audubon and uh, we'll see we'll see what I can do. Like if I'm if I'm here and not in the thick of teaching, I'm very happy to uh, <laughs> give people a, a tour for ideas. Awesome. 
Now, uh, have you ever had issues with HOAs? Or if not, do you have advice for how someone might approach dealing with, with an HOA? Yeah. So um, I, I don't live in an area that has an HOA. I, I think I'm sort of lucky to live in like uh, the worst street in the best neighborhood in, in Athens. So I live in five points, but it's a, uh, you know, it's a mixture of kind of like duplexes, rentals and, and kind of small houses that people own. Um, and I think luckily, you know, because some of these houses were rental uh, rentals, I think my yard actually looks a lot more uh, manicured and maintained than some of those yards. So I'm, I'm never like the the worst one on the on on the street. Um, my personal experience from uh, from neighbors are uh, uh, on, only positives, really. Uh, people walking their dogs uh, re remark on the flowers. They they remark in a good way about how it looks different from the other neighborhoods on their street. People say, uh, you know, I love to hear the bird song. I love to see it see the butterflies and the bees. So I've not really had anything but positive reinforcement there. But some things I've done like pretty intentionally, I've actually got two signs out in the in the front yard now. And again, this isn't some kind of bra bragging rights. It's again, that sort of reassuring people that, the, you know, this yard is maintained this way kind of um, intentionally. And I think the other thing sort of psychologically is I find myself like um, pottering around in the front yard quite a lot. I might be pruning something or staking something or planting something or just out there birding. But I think because I'm out there quite a lot and the neighbors see me out there quite a lot, it kind of reassures them that the yard is being cared for and maintained and not just being left to sort of uh, grow. I do recognize that like what I've done with my front yard is not going to work in, in, in many neighborhoods. Um, but I think even small pollinator beds can be very, very beneficial. Um, so just sort of adding these um, these features and clearly defining the boundaries of them um, is, is very important. I think providing that sort of structured look so there's nothing kind of looming over paths or, or public rights of way is a good idea. Um, and one thing you could do if you have like a sort of pollinator meadow that adjoins a road, um, you can just mow an 18 inch strip in front of it. And sometimes just the uh, the sheer fact of mowing that strip is an indicator to people that this area is being maintained, that this hasn't just been kind of left to, um, to neglect. Um, and I guess recently there was a heartening story where uh, someone I think in Maryland managed to actually take on their homeowners association and maintain their 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 yard. But but my hope is you know by by talking to groups like you all and you you all talking to to your neighbours that when people see it and get used to it, the more they see this kind of gardening and the more there are articles in the media about how we can um, help save our declining pollinators um, and help our migratory birds by making these plantings, I think it is becoming into the public sort of perception. So the more we can sort of normalize this and move away from the very uh, formal and manicured, um, you know, gardens that, uh, you know, don't support as much wildlife, um, the better really. Definitely. Yeah. Um, as Jennifer Staska, who works at the State Botanical Garden with um, Native Plant Conservation, would say, cues of care are very important. The small things that we do in our yards to show um, there's intention and everything going on. Um, uh, and while we're on that note, have you had any neighbors um, start adding native plants to their yards that you know of? Um yeah um so uh i mean so i had a rent renter next door who added some some of my native plants and then <laughs> then it got re-landscaped but um yeah i mean especially kind of in the in the wider neighborhoods so you know some of the people that have stopped while uh you know i'm in this fortunate position now where it's like shock horror i almost have enough plants and i probably shouldn't go to plant sales but i'm going to go anyway um but some of the plants that are really sort of abundant um that you know have started cropping up in places that i don't want them i've just been able to offer those to people um it's kind of fun for local birders in the area um i often just leave a couple of potted native plants on their doorstep as a little birthday gift um and uh, you know some of the plants from my yard have made it into you know the odium school of ecology where i work at uga we had a little student project to create a native garden there and it's really fun to be able to donate plants to to, to projects like that as well um so yeah my, my plants have made it sort of round and about and um yeah one one or two neighbors have incorporated like native plants into their landscaping and can you talk about some of your, I know you mentioned a couple earlier on, but some of your favorite sources for native plants or maybe where you've heard other people getting native plants? 
Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're very lucky here in the Athens uh, area to have the State Botanical Garden on our on, on our doorstep. And um, that hosts the Center for Native Plant Studies that, that both kind of studies and restores kind of wild native plants, but also propagates uh, native plants. Um, the good thing about buying somewhere like the State Botanical Garden, I mean, not only do you support their research and conservation mission, but also the plants they source are truly locally sourced. So some of the native plants um, that we'll see are actually quite widespread in the eastern US. But if, if you're importing seeds from somewhere in the northern US, um, that plant might not be kind of optimally locally adapted to conditions here. Um, so when you buy from a nursery that has uh, sourced its plants locally, um, they're much more likely to kind of thrive in, in, in your neighborhood and, and sort of be kind of appropriate for your, for your region. And the botanical garden, they, they have a, a spring plant sale that's not all native, but there is a native plant sand. And then the, the fall plant sale is just, um, it's, it's, a whole, uh, it's a whole lot of fun. It's a, it's a good experience to go to. And then my other favorite place that I kind of briefly mentioned in the presentation is Beach Hollow Farm. Uh, so they have a really uh, wonderful property out uh, near Lexington, Georgia, uh, out in the woods. And they not only kind of sell native plants there, but they've got a garden installation there, which I think is a nice inspiration for seeing these plants in their place. And I haven't made it out to their Scottsdale location yet, but um, they have both Atlanta and Athens settings. Um, and I find that they, they have a slightly different offering of plants from the State Botanical Garden, so the, the two are pretty, uh, pretty complementary. Uh, so I'd say they're my, uh, they're my go tos. Um, but there are lots of resources, I think, via sort of Georgia Audubon or your local ch Audubon chapter, if you're not in the Atlanta area, uh, they can usually point you to either businesses that sell local plants or, or plant sales that are going on. Those of you at the coast, uh, Coastal Wildscapes holds a big native plant sale, for example. Yeah, that's great. And I definitely want to shout out our friends over at the Georgia Native Plant Society, because I know they have some resources on their website listing some of the um, native plant nurseries and, and nurseries who sell native plants in the state. So that's another place to look to. And, um, and if you attended our round robin um, last Sunday, this past Sunday, um, you would learn that, you know, you can propagate a lot of native plants yourself as well. Um, and so that's another route to go about it. I personally don't think you need to pay a single dollar necessarily for um, for establishing, you know, a, a native yard or green space. Although there, of course, is tons of value in increasing the demand, you know, with with your money for native plants. Um, but it shouldn't be a limiting factor for you getting started in, in creating a space that's really special. So my next question for you is, how do you prevent leaves from being blown around in your yard into the winter and fall? Um, is a brush pile really sufficient? So how do you, I guess, deal with leaf management if you're not, you know, um, raking them up? And, and um, is that an issue for you? Um, yeah, that tends not to be an issue for me. So, so I should say, I don't leave leaves everywhere. I do I do sweep them off of my my driveway of my path and kind of out of the gutters in the street and and so on. Again, to sort of signal to people that this is maintenance and not neglect. Um, but yeah, I can rake a lot of the leaves into in, into beds. And I've made I mean I've made these uh, uh, paths just out of kind of uh, wood chip. And I usually just let the leaves sit there and they they kind of decompose pretty rapidly. Maybe it's a function of the fact that a lot of my canopy trees are water oaks, and I feel like those leaves are pretty sort of dense, so I don't find that they're blowing blowing around a whole lot. And, and I think the key is just sort of finding an area um, in, in your yard where um, that isn't isn't going to be too much of, a, of, of an issue. So, um, you know, if, if leaves... If, if you're finding that you're having trouble with kind of leaves blowing around kind of close to your house, maybe find like a, a back corner to kind of pile... Um, pile these leaves um, into. Um, yeah. Great. Next one is how do you prepare your soil before planting if if at all? Yeah, so this is this is still something I'm I'm sort of pretty pretty new to. Um, there are lots of things that you can do, like get kits to test your soil pH and find out whether it's sort of a, a acidic or not. Um, but typically, um, all all that I've done is um, I I've created a raised bed, 
And um, sometimes I'm able to source that soil from my own yard. I didn't actually mention this, but I have a compost pile. Um, so those leaves that I do kind of um, uh, sweep up or rake up uh, because they're they're in places I don't want them. Um, I put those and a lot of my other discarded plants um, in a compost pile in the back. So that provides a lot of kind of um, nutrient rich soil for free. Um, but then I might just go and buy some, um, you know, topsoil from a from a garden center. And my plants do just sort of fi fine in that. Um, I think it really uh, it really depends. Like if 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 you especially want to plant certain species and they require a sandier soil type, then you might want to sort of go out and make very specific amendments for those. But I guess my my style of gar uh, gardening has been a bit more Darwinian survival of the fittest. That essentially I just um, you know uh, provide them with some soft soil to get started with, water them in, and kind of you know wish them luck. And the things that do well. Um, you know, are, are meant to be there and the things that don't do so well, um, I don't really try to incorporate again. Great. Um, and kind of building off that, you mentioned in your presentation how you have employed the use of some raised beds. Um, have you kind of stuck to one design for establishing like these raised beds or what? how have you constructed them in your space? Yeah, I, I have, but I have to say that's not really for aesthetic reasons. It's just that, um, you know, I was able to buy these um, kind of ready-made uh, kits of plywood where there was, you know, kind of long planks of plywood with kind of corner posts. Um, and you can buy a bunch of those together. And so, you know, they give you a sort of like roughly a five foot by five foot square to work on at a time. Um, so I've generally used those for my raised beds um, in the beds that look a little more organic and sort of rounder in the in the backyard. I've kind of um, I guess I, I put down sort of uh, uh, red bricks at the base and then these kind of ornamental rocks on top of them that, you know, then get uh, uh, mossy and have a more natural feel. And and again, I've been able to sort of add um, compost and soil on top of those. But, you know, maybe just a. Uh, and uh, an, an inch or two uh, there. Um, so really whatever works for you. I'm probably gonna be revisiting the uh, design of my beds because these initial beds that I've put in, uh, the wood now is is in, in many of them kind of starting to, to, to rot. So they're, they're gonna be replacing, uh, I, I'm gonna be replacing several of them. Not all of them though, because one, one of the planks that fell the other day, I kind of uh, lifted it up and I found a, a cute little decays brown snake curled up underneath it. Um, so again, you know, these, uh, you know, some of these features you put in your yard can be quite, quite good for, for local wildlife. Any of those uh, rocks or branches you use for, uh, to, to line beds can be great places for critters to, beneficial critters to kind of hide underneath. Yeah, awesome. And I know some of your um, beds are kind of adjacent to some of the pathways that you have through your front yard. Um, mm -hmm. Someone wants to know if you have any recommendations for creating those pathways or maintaining those pathways in, in your yard. Um, yeah, so um, I, um, I have just uh, usually uh, put down sort of cardboard that I've, uh, that I've saved up or kind of gone to raid the grocery store across the road for, uh, for cardboard boxes. And I, I sort of put that down to suppress growth of things that I don't really want growing in the path. And then I've usually put some kind of like mulch or wood chip down to, uh, to line those. And that's really sort of the uh, extent of it. I guess around the side of the house, I've used more like sort of gravel uh, to keep those paths uh, uh, as, as they are. Um, sometimes weeds will grow up in them. And I think, uh, you know, if it gets to a situation where I'm just constantly battling weeds, that's usually a symbol for me that I should probably lay down some more sort of cardboard and, and kind of start afresh. But I've only had to do that like a couple of times in in, in 13 years. So I haven't found it to be um, too much maintenance um, at all. Got it. Um, you mentioned the uh, little decays brown snake. Um, somebody is interested if you see more native animals other than just the birds and the insects, chipmunks, snakes, foxes, squirrel, et cetera. Any interesting sightings that you've had? Well, in your well I, 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 I do. I do see a lot of uh, interesting things. And, um, you know, um, I'm just uh, I'm just pulling up a link I'm going to put in the in the chat here. But, uh, you know. 
just for later, if you want to take a, a peek at some of the other wildlife I see in my yard, uh, during lockdown, when I couldn't go anywhere, I started kind of diversifying a bit from birds and trying to identify, you know, lots of uh, insects and other critters that were using my yard and, and sort of photo documenting them. And I kind of post these on, on Instagram. So this is all kind of wildlife I've seen around the yard. Um, so a surprising diversity of insects, um, some some bumblebees that, are, you know, um, you know, threatened, uh, state listed as threatened things. Uh, like I think it was it the Great Plains bumblebee. Um, I forget. Um, lots of butterfly diversity. Uh, the pond itself hosts um, uh, which salamander gave? I always forget whether it's two lined or three lined. One of those. Two lined. Three lined, did you say? Two lined. You've had the two lined. Two lined. Yeah. Yeah, so they nest in the pond. Um, I've had gray frogs and leopard frogs breeding in the in the pond. Um, snakes, not nothing too exciting or interesting. Like the the, the brown snakes are obviously a few rat snakes. Uh, the pond's attractive to um, you know. I did put out a game camera um, at night occasionally, and it was interesting to see things like uh, armadillos coming into that yard. I usually just see those as road roadkill in um in in Athens but um yeah and a nice uh, a nice variety like uh, particularly of in uh, insects um and i'm i'm adding new insects all the time you know it's getting it's getting a little bit harder to add new new bird species as time goes on though there there can always be surprises um but yeah every, every year i go out and look at insects i find um i find new species and surprising species i've had a couple of butterfly species that only breed on li river cane and i've just got two or three stand uh you know individual kind of stalks of native cane in my backyard and i don't know whether they found those or how they found them but um yeah um i'm constantly surprised by wildlife so it's a, it's kind of like a a constant joy and the great thing about watching the pollinators is that, you know, the summertime is is maybe kind of one of the quieter times for birds. They might be very secretive when they're feeding young at the nest. But that's obviously like the awesome time to see butterflies and, and, and bees and a good diversity of them. So there's always something to be seen. Awesome. Now, uh, a couple more questions we have to go through. Um, the next one is, have bird predators ever been an issue for you? Um, I bet they also tend to like native plants, et cetera, question mark. Um, so let's let's break down uh, bird predators. Um, we've got some like native wild uh, predators like like hawks. And um, I certainly have seen a lot of hawks in the yard. Um, but I'm happy to 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 see those, you know, a hawk's a hawk's got to eat too. I, I've never seen a situation um arise where that hawk has been an, an, an issue like I, I you know I see hawks pretty regularly but I wouldn't say they just like sit motionless on my on, on my bird feeders or anything um free roaming cats um every once in a while um I guess one way in which I'm fortunate is um several of the yards that adjoin mine have have dogs which I think kind of helps keep the uh the cats more or less out of the of, of the yard, although often I pick them up on the nocturnal game cameras and cats that I've never seen during the day. Um, I haven't really had an issue with them. Um, if I do see a, a cat sort of, you know, more than once or twice, I, I, I usually kind of like run out the door to sort of uh, spook it off. And I, I think, you, you know, you just have to um, react to the situation that, that faces you. So, um, you know, by providing native plants and particularly that that shelter, um, you know, kind of um, shrubs or, or brush piles, you are providing an escape route um, for for wildlife um, from from predators, and that's just sort of beneficial. Um, but I think you know, if if you're if you're in a situation where you feel like you've got like a, a dozen feral cats prowling your yard, like uh, you know, maybe unfortunately un un unless there's another way to deal with that issue like maybe that isn't the ideal situation to sort of put um a bird feeder or a bird a attracting part so uh, a bird attracting plant but yeah really um I, I i think that you know there's this net benefit to providing food and shelter and and cover um that is going to help these birds to sort of deal with with predators and obviously you can always get out and, and chase off a, a predator that you consider to be a problem. But I love seeing the hawks. I have no issue with them. 
Awesome. Uh, one question following up on the kind of the pathways in the front yard. Um, do you know if there's a better type of wood chip to use for paths? Pine nuggets seem to suggest seem to wash away cypress, not so much. Are there any issues with mm -hmm. colorized mulch? Do you have any any kind of insight on on that? Um, I'm I'm just going to say uh, no, because I've I've been a little bit sort of uh, op opportunistic there. Um, I agree that sort of mulch can like the 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 mulch you talked about can sometimes kind of sit sort of very nicely. But um, I've sometimes used those those pine bark nuggets, which are pretty sort of coarse. And um, maybe maybe it's because of the terrain in my yard but there's like a very gentle incline in the front yard and the backyard so i often find there are these kind of ridges that like if there is a a very heavy rain gouging event of, of course some of that mulch moves but it tends to sort of accumulate in places that it's easy to kind of um kind of scrape back into into place um so maybe it's just a question of of having some like little kind of divots or areas that will sort of um collect the mulch within the path so it doesn't all just kind of wash down your yard in a in a heavy rain event um but yeah honestly i i don't have a specific recommendation because it's not i i guess for me the 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 pine bucks worked um uh, pretty well so i've i've sort of just stuck with that and not really experimented all right, the last question that we have currently in the Q&A is when choosing natives in a small yard, how do you identify which are going to be invasive over growing other natives and identify those that are good companions to other natives? So maybe a little bit, yeah, about your theory with plant selection mm -hmm. and um, invasive and what plants complement one another. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so the, the you know, the ecologist in me always wants to use the word like invasive very, um, you know, sort of carefully that uh, we're typically, when we use the word invasive, we're talking about something that isn't necessarily indigenous to the to the region and um, tends to cause sort of, um, you know, ecological problems. Um, I think my friends at the Botanical Garden talk about these these plants that are native but very prolific and that can outcompete other plants. They kind of call them thugs. Um, and um, they tend to kind of put them, I, I, yeah, you, you want to put those in places like in, in the back of your yard where they can kind of um, grow free. The, the best advice I can give you is to kind of seek expertise from, from people at um, Georgia Audubon. I sort of found this out by, um, uh, by, by trial and error, essentially. Um, what was going to grow prolifically, uh, because occasionally something that grows really well in your yard, other people will struggle to keep alive. Um, I have a plant called Georgia Aster, which is a wonderful, really beautiful native plant. But in some areas of my yard, it forms these like large monocultures. And I dig that up and give that to people who then say they've struggled to, you know, keep keep that plant alive. But I'd say, you know, from from experience, some of the plants that can grow like pretty tall and leggy in my yard have included cut leaf coneflower, um, uh, giant ironweed. Um, some of the Joe Pye weed varieties can grow to like 10 feet tall. Um, some sunflower varieties, things like swamp sunflower, I found um, is one that will spread, whereas others like purple disc sunflowers haven't spread quite so aggressively. Uh, so they're the ones that come to mind in my yard where I put them in and I was initially, because I had this blank canvas, initially I was super happy to have a plant that was growing prolifically. But then as my bed started to fill in, I noticed, hey, you know, I, want, I didn't want this to be uh, overgrown. So they're the plants that I've kind of like moved a little bit further back to form a sort of middle island in my in my front yard. Um, and um, yeah, plants like pokeweed, which I didn't buy. It's, uh, you know, it's a native plant that sort of gets everywhere. That's not going to be appropriate for every single person's yard. But there are some places in the back of my yard where I feel like I can uh, let it go and uh, sort of keep it managed in that in, in that one area. Um, but yeah, um, as, aside from, you know, my trial and error, I think, um, yeah, just talking to people at the Botanical Garden or at Georgia Audubon, um, if, if you have questions uh, about that. Um, as a rule of thumb, I feel like if, if, if the plant isn't going to grow more than like um, two feet, I generally tend to find a lot of those are sort of quite well behaved. And it's been the ones in my yard that have grown to like in that six to 10 feet range, range that have sometimes uh you know, I've, I've, I've had to scale those back a bit. 
Right. Well, if we don't have any more questions, I'd like to thank everyone for attending and also remind you that we still have um, a handful of events left for the Georgia Grows Native for Birds Month here in September. And you can check out our website to learn um, more about those events. Uh, Richard, thank you so much for your time and for taking the lead. Certainly your yard is inspiring and You've learned so much and there's so much that um, we can apply to our own green spaces. I wanted to ask if there's anything else you wanted to uh, say before um, before we conclude. Uh, no, just uh, I'm, you know, I'm I, I love uh, talking to people, you know, native gardening is 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 addictive and, um, you know, it's brought sort of so much uh, joy and, um, you know, stress relief to my life kind of doing this that. Um, I mean, you know, I hope it's been good for for birds and native wildlife, but it's certainly been good for my um, my own uh, well being, and uh, I just can't sort of rec uh, recommend it enough. And and you know, don't feel like you have to, uh, you know, try and aim for. You know, I I really went all in for the for the birds with with my yard, but you know, even just a small pollinator bed, even just a you know a, a couple of native features are going to enhance the value of your yard for wildlife. So just do what's appropriate for your space, and you can start small and just sort of take it from there. Um, but it's uh yeah, it's a a really kind of joyful and I I think quite important thing to do. So I appreciate you all for kind of uh, being here and having uh, interest in kind of in, embarking on that. Journey journey so thanks for coming yeah yeah there's uh a really cool bird called the nashville warbler and the first one i ever saw in my life was in richard's backyard so it just goes to show um that these tiny small spaces can be really special and can really uh, uh be appealing to a great diversity of wildlife and you know our birds are traveling across the globe going all the way from as far north as the arctic circle all the way down to Central and South America and in your yard can be a space where they seek refuge and gain some resources on their journey. So yeah, thank you so much everyone for attending and um, yeah, have a great evening. Take care. Thank you everybody.